got YouTube going. And recording. All right, thank you everybody for being here. And YouTube started reading my, saying my own words back to me there. Sorry about that. Um, we've got Dr. Mark Nanos here. Uh, Mark is a Jewish historian who has spent a lot of time uh, studying the life and the writings of Paul. And that may seem unusual for a Jewish historian, but I think that you will find that, uh, that Mark is, a, is an unusual historian. He's written a number of books and essays on Paul and his writings and uh, you know, the origins of Christianity within the, the Jewish context of the first century. Um, but one of his missions has been to correct misconceptions that people have on both sides of the aisles, you know, Jewish misconceptions of Paul and Christian. Uh, also want to mention that uh, for one of his books, The Mystery of Romans, this one here, which I'll which I will put a link to later on. I'll put that in the show or in the, uh, the description later. Uh, was a 1996 National Jewish Book Award for Christian Jewish Relations winner. And I've started reading it. I'm not done with it. And so far, it's great. Uh, really enjoying it. And I am, I am learning a lot. You know, I grew up in, a, uh, in a, a Christian home, Assemblies of God, with a lot of respect for Israel and the Jewish people, but almost no knowledge. And although at this point in my life, I probably understand more of the Jewish perspective than 99% of other Christians, I still find that I don't really understand it all that much. I've got a long, long ways to go and a lot to learn. So uh, I appreciate you all being here. And I really appreciate Dr. Nanos being able to join us. Um, so uh, Dr. Nanos, if you don't mind, uh, if you could introduce yourself, kind of give us a, a quick idea of, you know, where you're coming from. How did you get here? You know, growing up, I, I assume that you grew up in a Jewish home. Um, why Paul? What, what brought you to this line of study? Yeah, well, thanks for uh, having me. I look forward to talking with all of you and, and taking some of your questions and trying to make sense of what I'm trying to make sense of for you and your terms. Um, my discovery of Paul was actually um, a bit of a surprise. I was in uh, doing a degree in Jewish studies in the 70s. Yes, I'm old. Um, I had returned to school. That's when... Uh, that's when Roots was on uh, TV, before most of you were born, probably. And uh, I remember there was that. A university. <laughs> yeah, there was a university down the street. And I decided to go back to school, take some uh, classes in, uh, at night on, uh, in Jewish studies in the history department. And uh, in one of the classes on uh, studying apocalypticism and uh, eschatology, we read, of course, uh, the prophetic texts of the, of the Bible and so on, but other uh, Second Temple Jewish literature. And I thought, gosh, um, all this criticism was understood to be within, amongst Israelites or Jews. Uh, and um, no one would think that when Isaiah said something like, you know, I don't care about, God didn't care about your sacrifices, that meant stop sacrificing or that he had left Israelite religion or Judaism, if you will, um, or Jeremiah or whatever, and castigating the leaders. No one thought that meant they left, converted away from it. But with Paul, it meant that he was throwing stones from outside and had left it and, it, and, and no longer valued it. And so I thought, well, um, I knew a little Greek. I had lived in Greece for some years as a teenager and I could read the lexicons I could I wasn't competent to translate, but I, I could read lexicons and I could I decide to do a paper on Romans 11, uh, the part about all Israel will be saved is the usual English translation. And um, I, I wrote this paper in 1977. And um, I just had this suspicion, this intuition that Paul had really been totally misunderstood. Not totally, but I mean, largely misunderstood. And, um, but it wasn't part of my program. And I was a 
you know, I had a, a graphic design and advertising business and a little family, and you know, I, I couldn't pursue it uh, in graduate school like I had hoped to. But I continued to think about it over the years. And um, one thing we studied a lot, of course, was the Holocaust and the uh, the way that Christian theologizing of Jews and Judaism uh, had affected not only Western culture, but Jewish people in Western culture in such harmful ways. And it struck me over the years, it just kind of grew on me. If I'm right about the historical Paul, how we ought to read him, um, it might have some payoff in terms of humanitarian uh, effort to change Christian narrative, Christian imagination, Christian rhetoric of Jews and Judaism, uh, which resurfaces in, in culture in all sorts of ways. I mean, even in philosophy between um, a spirit and flesh and faith and action, all these are, are part of Western cultural problems or issues that are conceptualized partly through a particular way of reading Paul that I think is mistaken. It's, it's, it's really misunderstood him, just as it would have misunderstood Isaiah if it read him uh, similarly. And so uh, somewhere along the way, I decided it was time to uh, try to write a small essay. In the, in the early 90s, my business and family were, were maturing, and I thought, oh, I've just got to try to do something. And that eventually turned into what you, you showed uh, 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 folks, the mystery of Romans, which was a shocking thing for me and shocking that it got published by a major uh, press, um, probably the leading press on Paul at the time, and uh, that it got such significant reviews and notice in the Society of Biblical Literature. And I, I became a member of it, didn't even know that sort of thing existed, didn't know scholars really. And, um, and then eventually I sold my business in the 90s, did a PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland on my work on Galatians, which became the irony of Galatians uh, afterwards. And then I went on to do other books. Now I have a series of essays, and sorry for the self-promotion, but it's kind of important for this is, this one is, is reading Paul within Judaism, which I, I really hope I'll encourage you to look at. And it's followed by volume two, reading Romans within Judaism. And volume three on Galatians, I'm, I'm still in the act of working on. And, and volume four was already published on uh, Corinthians and Philippians. And these have my scholarly essays and non-scholarly ones and some unpublished works that I did maybe as papers at Society of Biblical Literature or other kind of conferences. And um, uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about in it, as you're getting ready to approach Paul and Romans is, is, is part of my introduction in this reading Paul within Judaism, which is the idea that before you read something, you already think you know stuff. I mean, the very nature, when you pick up a Bible, you expect to read a certain way and, and, and see a certain thing. When, when you pick up a comic book, you, you expect to read and, and see something else. You pick up a, a fic, fiction, if you pick up a newspaper, you read them differently. And you have, if you pick up a newspaper from the right versus a newspaper from the left, a newspaper by a Christian, a newspaper by an atheist, um, you, you have presuppositions and um, I try to bring these out actually in many of in many of my essays, but I actually speak to it directly in the introductory essay for uh, reading Paul in Judaism because it sets up the whole platform. If, if we think we know before we read, then we read to confirm what we think we know. And that's normal. But if we say we're seekers of truth, and we ought to read with an open-mindedness that the truth might be something other than what others have told us and informed us and shaped us uh, to expect it to be. And so that's really a, kind of an important starting place. So uh, for me, that's a little bit of my, of my history. Now, part of the problem of my personal narrative is that um, you know, when I imagined this, and for the most part to this date, I would say most Christians don't really necessarily appreciate what I'm trying to do uh, because it messes with their own story, their own narrative, their own worldview. And um, we might call that ideology. That is to say, if somebody comes along and says, well, we don't breathe air, you think, well, that's an idiot. Uh, 
<laughs> and you know, you have to pause and say, well, what do you think we breathe? And then they could explain to you scientifically what we actually breathe. But, um, but a lot of people aren't gonna do that. Um, and the Jews are certainly not, for the most part, congratulating me uh, because uh, the Jewish narrative about Paul and Christian origins is based on the Christian perception and just accepting that this reading of Paul, for example, is accurate. And so he's either um, a terrible person uh, to present Jews and Judaism the way that he does and to leave it behind. He's not trustworthy. Uh, the way he's often interpreted as a Jew to the Jew and a Greek to the Greek and so on, you know, he's some sort of a, a liar. Um, he can't be trusted. He just, uh, he's just a manipulator. And, um, and that has worked in a way for the Jewish community as a minority community in the Christian West that is persecuted and harmed in many ways and, and uh, stereotyped negatively because it others him, it, it moves him off the map. So for a Jewish person to come along and say, well, he ought to be on the Jewish map, Christians have misread him and we need to do the hard work of trying to reread him. Well, that's, that's not necessarily attractive and it's a big challenge, just as it's a big challenge for Christians to say, maybe you should reread this guy and rethink these things. So in a way, it's a fairly unwelcome. But as I said, I see it as a humanitarian interest that the world has not worked well for the Jewish people and Judaism. And in my opinion, for Christianity uh, and Christians, there's a lot of misperceptions that are built into self-identity that are harmful to themselves and to other people. And the question is, do they need to be this? Do their, uh, does a proper reading of their texts and their history <clears throat> only come to the same conclusions <clears throat> that are the most uh, familiar conclusions? That's not to say there isn't a place for criticism. Obviously, the, the, the scriptures are full of things that <clears throat> we wouldn't tell our children are really the best way to behave uh, towards their neighbor. Um, and so there's always a place for criticism of that. And that's true for Paul, I think, uh, as well. Um, and there's always things in there that are hard to understand that perhaps were written um, ironically or in such a, um, a context that if you weren't there, you wouldn't understand them. And probably the biggest problem is all of us are informed by previous readings. All translations are interpretations. Uh, even the texts of the Greek that we consider if somebody held up their Greek Bible and said, yeah, well, it's right here. Well, that's actually also a formulation from bits and scraps that are hundreds of years after Paul that interpreters have decided are the best uh, representations. And why did they decide the best? Because they fit what they, their interpretive worldview of Paul uh, would be. And when there's something that doesn't fit that as well, it's not the one that gets chosen. So it's a very messy, complicated task. And when we come to it and think we just read the Bible, it's just right there. And, and by the way, even scholars will do this with me. And they'll say, well, how can you say Paul um, you know, is behaving Jewishly or advocating for Judaism? Look, there's Galatians 2, there's Galatians 3, there's Romans 2, there's Romans 7, there's Philippians 3, there's 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 8, how can you say this? And they just can read off as if a translation, but what I'm part of my project is say, but each of these flashpoint texts involve choices, in interpretive choices, translation choices, uh, contextual choices. And, and I'm trying to show over the years, as now are some others, this is actually a movement now, um, that each of those are very suspect. And there's not only uh, alternatives, in many cases, the alternatives are more natural to the language of Greek of Paul's time, for example, if we just stay with Paul. And so they actually ought to be privileged um, rather than uh, disregarded. So that's kind of an introduction to what, you know, what I've done and what I'm doing. I, I left my career um, to do this and, um, and I've created a, a separate career for a while as a professor too. And, uh, but I, there's a lot of work to be done to make the convincing case. Yeah, that's great, thank you. It, there are a couple of points there that I wanna go back to, but that last statement, you know, talking about how you left your former career 
to pursue you know this line of academic inquiry and writing and and you know all of the other things you're doing uh i think most of us settle on some kind of compromise between what we can stand to do and what will pay us or what mm-hmm. we really want to do and what will pay us to live and sure. uh, when you get to the point where you can actually shift over into doing the thing that you really love and it pays you enough to actually feed you and your family that's that's a dream for most people and i'm i'm aiming for it i'll i'll be there someday yeah yeah <laughs> Well, just to be well, just to be clear, uh, mine doesn't pay for that. Um, my, actually, the strategy that uh, that was suggested to me back in the '70s, if I wanted to do this crazy idea, was to use the gentleman scholar uh, uh, model in the rabbinic tradition. And that is to make enough money to build a business and uh, be able to finance it yourself, so you can say crazy things and you're not beholden to 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 some. To, to say in the party line that it takes to work within the field of religious studies or, or, or and so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've actually been doing this with, I've been actually doing this for a long time uh, without much income and really with quite a change for my family in the beginning, especially, uh, but it's just, you know, we have one life to live and um, mm-hmm. what is it that we're, what is it we want to do with it? And this has been, uh, this has been the choice. Sometimes it feels a bit of a, crazy choice for a Jewish person uh, to uh, to have to identify that this is what I've done with my life is try to understand this Christian apostle Paul mm-hmm. the quintessential con- and uh, <laughs> upset my upset the Jewish world and, uh, and and more or less piss off the Christian world most of it uh, really is that what you can do with your life but uh, so far so good yeah I, I can relate um, <laughs> you know I uh, I I got to, to where I am. There's some similar elements in my story and how I got to where I am. One of the things that I just, the thing, doctrines that I was brought up with just never seemed to add up. You know, like the Bible talks about keeping the Sabbath. Well, there's nothing in the New Testament that says, you know, the Sabbath moved to Sunday. So why are we doing this thing? Why don't we do it the way the Bible says? And I could never find a good mm-hmm. answer for that. And these lines of inquiry led me to the place where I was saying, I need to forget all of the creeds, all of the, the dogma, and read the Bible for what it says or for what it's intended to say. Mm. You know, the original right. authors were trying to convey some kind of message. I want right. to find out what they were trying to tell us, not right. what we're told they were trying to tell us. Mm. Because, mm. you know, like you're saying that um, we approach the scriptures with an idea in our head already of what they mean. And that's a huge barrier to understanding. And if we can just set that aside, long enough to understand the person and the people that he was writing to, we're going to get a whole lot more out of it. Uh, and that's a, that that's is a right. really difficult thing, not just because we've got our own preconceptions, but because the people who wrote the scriptures and the people they were written to are practically aliens. They come from yeah. such a different culture, from such a different right. mindset, a style of writing. It is so foreign right. to us that it's difficult to wrap right. our minds around it sometimes. That's right. That's right. And some of it we know, uh, some things we can study about what, what life was like in the, in the 50s, uh, 40s and 50s of the first century when Paul was mm-hmm. writing. But a lot of it we can't know. Um, and uh, just as all correspondence, like if you write a letter to someone and other people read it, there's a lot of in-house language between two people, family members, friends, lovers, that is, is coded. It's, it's not clear to someone else, and you can, they can easily misread it. Obviously, we can have conversations all the time. What family, what, what relationship doesn't have conversations? That's not what I said. Well, that is what you said. Well, that's not what I meant. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was being funny. I was being ironic. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. But if it's written down, then it's said. Uh, mm-hmm. There's no chance that we don't have the next letter that corrects yeah, been, and so on. Um, yep. the, the, the fact that people in antiquity, like Paul, they didn't write their own letters. You see in Romans, in the end of the he thanks the, the secretary that wrote. Uh, this letter. Paul did not write Romans. We speak of him, 
but he used a secretary. Why did he use a secretary? Well, because writing was uh, of letters, uh, epistolography was a very specialized practice. You studied rhetoric and it was a sub-discipline of rhetoric. You know, my, my grandmother who came from uh, Latvia, she spoke Yiddish. When she needed mm-hmm. to do correspondence, she had her children, only one of my father was the only one born in America, the other four weren't, and they, they did that for her and she signed her name, but she didn't read and write in English. She could still co- have correspondence, legal or other, and that's the way it was in antiquity. Uh, even a, an educated person, unless they were a secretary, and they used syllogisms to, to, to write with. So there's a letter like, we have a Dear John letter. You know, we know mm-hmm. that, that correspondence comes and it says, you are really a great person. We're waiting for the but. I love you, um, but. It, we know that's what it is. We, we can sense it from the form, even maybe from the kind of uh, format of the that the text comes to us, the kind of envelope it is, the, the nature of the moment. Um, Galatians, I've argued, uh, with uh, some others, is a letter of ironic rebuke, a well known letter style. When the parents have, uh, when the child's gone away to college and the parents have sent money and don't hear from the kid until they want money again, and the parent starts off with, Oh, I'm surprised you're calling us so quickly. Uh, just to visit, <laughs> which is a way of expressing disappointment with the child's mm-hmm. behavior, not surprise. Uh, parents can well expect the children to behave that way, but it's a way of expressing disappointment. If you read it as surprise at the literal level, you miss the point. And so um, there's all of these aspects, not just of trying to study culture, but to study a text in a culture, communicating between people, when you're not present in a language that's not our language, it's not even a living mm-hmm. language. I mean, modern Greek has, has evolved from it, but it's not. You know, try to read, try to read uh, uh, ancient English language, and see how difficult it is. And you're not going to get nuance because you're struggling hard just to get meaning. And likewise, in Greek, uh, this happens for modern Greeks with, with ancient Greek. And so, gosh, to get it right. Uh, you really have to be open-minded. You have to do an awful lot of study, not, not just of the culture, but of how you study culture, methodology, mm-hmm. psychology, sociology, anthropology, and so on. All the ologies, uh, especially rhetoric, rhetorical theory, how you read words. And um, so it's a big task. It's hard. Obviously, everybody can't do it. But when you open your Bible, People that should have done that have made the choices for you about what it means. It's mm-hmm. just not simple. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with the with Paul's the format of his writing, you're writing letters to people. In the case of Romans, people that he didn't know, but you know, in the case of Corinthians and Galatians, these are people that he had met before and he he had an right. established relationship. And well, in right. most cases, he was responding to something that they had sent him or that he had heard from somebody. And that's true about Romans too. And this personal nature of the communication brings in all kinds of idiomatic expression. You know, it's more conversational, more, you know, if if you read a formal English text and then you compare it to a conversation or a transcript of a talk like this one, the transcript is hardly going to make any sense at all because yeah. you're missing the intonation and you know all kinds yeah. of things. And the problem isn't yeah. quite as bad with a written letter, but there's still so much idiom and colloquialism, so much inside baseball that, I mean, That's even right. that phrase, of course, would, would be incomprehensible a thousand years from now. Inside baseball might yeah. be incomprehensible to much of the world right this moment if they were listening mm-hmm. to the conversation. Right, um, and um, yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is just a fact. It's just a, it's, it's something that we, it should make us very humble and it should make us keep scratching around, make sure that we've gotten it as right as possible for each word and phrase and sentence and paragraph and chapter, which of course those parts weren't there until just a few hundred years ago and letter. Um, mm-hmm. And then that body of letters and then which is a part of a body of bigger letters that we don't know, 
which all, except for Romans, all come after relationships in which he's expressed himself. And now he's fixing, seeking to fix things that are misunderstandings or additional ways of he thinks he needs to re-enunciate or he needs to challenge the direction that they took what he originally said. Uh, maybe they even are rejecting. You know, it's not like everybody agreed about this stuff. When there were only mm-hmm. 10 or 20 or 100 of them, they already disagreed. So it's, it's no big surprise that there would be a lot of disagreement when there's a billion Christians um, yeah. about what these things mean. Uh, it's, yes. So that's articulating the task is difficult it ought to make us humble. It ought to make us work hard. And mm-hmm. for people who look at Paul for guidance in their lives, which, which I expect that most of your, your audience is interested in, it, it, it should make you really um, uh, curious and humble and, uh, and recognize how hard it is and hopefully not scare you that when somebody says something a little different than what you've always heard, that doesn't mean it's mm-hmm. wrong or... Uh, a, a necessarily a threat. It's a threat maybe to what you thought, but it might be helpful if you want to actually get at the most probable truth. Do you want to live in a bubble because you live in a bubble, or do you, do you want to get the best information possible and uh, live the most authentic life you can? Authenticity, you know, is that important? Yeah. And uh, yeah, we started our our study of Romans a couple of weeks ago with kind of an introduction of who Paul was. And, you know, mostly I drew from uh, Acts and Galatians and a little bit of history here and there, you know, little, little bits from Suetonius and other people who mention events that, that, in, you know, kind of inform what might be going on in Rome at the time. Um, but I'm curious from your perspective, uh, you know, Paul grew up in Tarsus, which is, you know, a Greek city, not in, in the land of Judea or Galilee or any of the, the territories that would, uh, you know, comprise what we think of as Israel. But he grew up in a Jewish enclave in a Greek city. And at least from his, from what we know of his Greek style, uh, he was never, he was never really, you know, academically fluent in Greek. Uh, his Greek wasn't, you know, finely honed. Um, so it seems to me that he probably did not, he probably kept himself separate, that he was, he knew Greek, he could speak and write it, he grew up in a Greek city, but was still thoroughly Jewish. There seems to be a, a huge divide. You know, for, from your perspective, what was that culture like? I mean, what, what's it like growing up in a city that is primarily Greek and you are a, uh, at least from the, from what, from what we hear in Acts, that you know, Paul probably grew up in a wealthy, well-connected family, but we're still keeping themselves separate. What What does this culture look like? Well, I'm going to pull apart some of your, your comments there that mm-hmm. I think are um, normal, common. Kind of rambling, too. I don't think they're, they're, they're probably not historically, um, they're historically accurate. Now, he may or may not have grown up in Tarsus. So let me just qualify Acts for a moment. So Acts is, no one knows when Acts is written, but there's pretty good reason to believe that it's written somewhere around 50 years, 40, 50 years after Paul's time. And I like lots of things that Acts says, but there's some things about that it says that aren't very clear. So just to say, we have to qualify some things. We don't know too much about Paul's uh, early life in terms of where he was, but even if we accepted all the stuff in Acts, um, the Jewish communities of, of the middle first century were not what you would think of as enclaves. And so this kind of a broad thing, um, Judaism or the kinds of ways of Jewish ways of being in the world at that time was a Greco-Roman religion. It had already been under the Greeks, you know, been under the Babylonians, been under the Persians, been under the Greeks for 300 years and now under the Romans for uh, almost a century. And it was a part of the world not that different than what it is to talk about, say, an American Jew or an American Catholic. Um, There's conflict sometimes at certain points, 
and for some people, those become super big deal. But for a lot of people, they're not a very big deal. They can become salient at some moment in time, a political moment, say, or something. But in general, they don't think necessarily exactly like an Italian Catholic or an Italian Jew, uh, an Israeli Jew or an Israeli Catholic. Uh, and so thinking about our Jew Jewish communities at the time, prior to 70 and the revolt, Jews were generally a part of the Greco-Roman diaspora world, pretty much mixed in. They were among the many others, you know, Egyptian others and Syrian others and, and, and African others and uh, Persian others. And so they might be some stereotyping as strangers, especially by elite Romans, which is most of the literature that we had to, to read. Um, but most people thought of them as you know, really good people uh, with some weird religious practices. He probably, um, Paul probably, as it's hard to know anything about his parents or his, his early life, you know, whether he was married ever, all that sort of stuff. People can speculate all they like, but we really mm -hmm. just don't know. What what we know what, what what we know from him is that later in life, he was a Pharisee calls himself a Pharisee. And the Pharisaic movement, as far as we know, was primarily in Judea. It was a, uh, and it was diversified. By the way, we can't just talk about Pharisees. You know, there's all kinds of Pharisees, just like every other yeah. sort of group. And he not only identifies himself as coming from the Pharisaic group, which privileged the uh, traditions of the fathers as a part of the best way to interpret the textual, the texts versus the priestly class, the Sadducean class that ran the temple, who were more complicit with the Romans in a certain kind of way in order to protect the people from, you know, from, from the Romans coming in and running it so that the religious Jewish leaders ran it and they could have a sacrificial system and run the temple and all. And they were the elites and they became the wealthier class in general. Pharisees were... Um, vying for the people's uh, hearts, kind of like you might think of the, the Protestants in, a, in an anachronistic way in, in, the, in the Renaissance period, vying for the people's hearts, democratizing in some ways. And Paul explains himself as more zealous than his peers, I assume in his particular little Pharisaic group, in that he was trying to stop it, what's usually translated as uh, uh, he was persecuting is actually a word that means prosecute. It's kind of a legal. Mm -hmm. He was trying to stop, and it, and it doesn't say violently kill any Paul's he tells about himself. He was he was making a great effort piece together why. So what appears is that he was the most zealous in a small Pharisaic group that was promoting a way for non-Jews to become what we could now call proselytes. They weren't necessarily called proselytes then, become Jews, to, to cross this religio-ethnic uh, boundary and become part of the Jewish people. And this was a way to satisfy Roman concerns because the Romans had allowed the Jews to avoid cult to the end part and other kinds of civic cult to the other gods, which most Romans and Greeks and of all local places would have feared because the gods are going to be angry if you don't feed them, if you don't respect them, if you don't do cult. And the Romans said, okay, you've got this weird thing with your God, but you've been loyal to us. You helped Pompeii you, you, uh, take over from the Greeks. And we, in general, grant you that you can avoid this kind of cult. Twice a day, the Jews then in the temple made a burnt, burnt sacrifice in honor of Caesar, not to Caesar. And so the Jewish people had a, a, a throughout the diaspora, gave money to help pay for this 
uh, and it was a way of all the Jews were sort of understood by Romans to be good citizens, but like Amish kids, they don't go to war. You know, they do peace service or something, but they're, they're weird, but they're, they're okay. We, they're an exception. Other boys that aren't Amish are expected to register for the draft. And this is what kind of an analogy, kind of what the problem is. So the Pharisees, of uh, uh, Paul's group of Pharisees, whatever they were, I, I think were promoting circumcision, I, which is just a synecdoche, it's just a way of saying, like the White House. Right. right. It means a whole bunch of people. Circumcision, which is the final act for males of, of this conversion transformation process to become Jews, cross like we call it. Um, and he was extremely zealous to stop a movement that wasn't circumcising non-Jews, that was making them part of a Jewish movement through the confession of a mess- messianic figure, which would upset the Romans. Not only that, the Romans had killed this figure. So it's like, you know, signing up with uh, some kind of terrorist organization. It's going to scare your parents and your neighbors. And so he was against it because there there was a way to initiate non-Jews that the Romans would accept if they were going to stop doing other cult. And the Christ group was, from the very beginning, was saying, but but James and John John and Peter and so forth, they were, their non-Jews and their groups were no longer doing this cult. But they hadn't become Jews. That's political. That creates a social problem for other Jews. Even if in theory, they don't care, they're fine. Hey, mm-hmm. messianic figure, this, that. But now, wait a minute, you're dragging non-Jews in here, telling them that the full members, that they don't have to do civic cult, we're going to lose our right, right? If, if, if an Anabaptist preacher starts telling other boys that are not Anabaptists, um, you can avoid the war, just come to our meeting, Anabaptists have to police that. They have to say, no, you can't do that. If you do that, our boys are going to have to go in the service. You know, we have a special. So I think they're a Jewish group. It's a long story, but I think it's important to, to understanding um, the context for Paul's, what Paul is really all about, I think. He was a leader in proselytizing and against a group that wasn't doing it of a, of a few tens and hundreds, whoever the earliest Christ followers, however many there were in Judea, he was trying to stop them because it was dangerous. And then he has this revelation. And the revelation is, oh, the end of the ages has arrived. It's begun. And all the nations are going to stream in and worship Israel's God demonstrate it's all of the nations. It would only turn them into Jews and to Israelites, and God would still only be the God of Israel, of the Jews. You'll see this in Romans 3 is his argument. Isn't he the God of all the nations? Well, then they can't be circumcised. And so he is, that's why he was so zealous for it and against a movement. Now he's going to be the chief promoter in that movement that you cannot circumcise. That is to say, make them into Jews. He's not mm-hmm. against circumcision. He's absolutely for circumcision right. of Jews. Not a question. The question is, can the non-Jews worship alongside the Jews as a community, even though it threatens the Romans and the Jewish organizations are going to police that and try to crack down on you, not because they're against it in theory when that time comes, but because there's no work for that. What do you mean that time has come? Nothing's changed. The Romans are in control. The end of the ages isn't here, buddy. And so then Paul's mission is to show these non-Jews are so Jewish. They have left their idols. They have left their sinful ways. And they've become righteous without the privileges of being proselytes. And they're willing to suffer that for the propositional claim of the gospel that the end of the ages has come. And that's the way he's going to persuade. Now he's on the other side. That's the way he's going to persuade his Pharisee buddies uh, mm-hmm. and other Jews that something empirically has changed. That's why it's so important to him that they don't act the way that they're tempted to act. Don't reason the way they're tempted to reason because they weren't raised within a Jewish cultural. They don't know the Bible. They, they, they raised on Homer if they're raised at all on, on sophisticated things. 
and general stoic philosophy, things that are in the air, like you know, popular music uh, promotes in our in our times. And uh, so that's his project. That's who I think he was, and I think that's important for trying to understand who he is and what he's doing, like in a letter like Romans where he's still addressing non-Jews. He's not addressing Jews at Romans. He's addressing non-Jews who now find out if they take this seriously and they don't become proselytes, they're gonna ex experience social dissonance because the larger Jewish community members are gonna say, hey, that's not how it works. You're welcome to become proselytes, but if you don't become proselytes, you're not entitled, and this is a minority community, you're not entitled to access to our limited goods. You're not entitled to the honor rating of a proselyte if you don't become a proselyte. And in yeah. Rome, unlike Galatians, and in Rome, what a, Paul fears, what he's heard, what he surmised, what he anticipates, is that they're growing resentful. And they're starting to say, okay, mm -hmm. kind of like a teenager, kind of like a teenager to the parents. Oh, yeah, I'll show you. Uh, and uh, disrespect, and Paul is calling them back and saying, no, 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 this is part of the plan. You don't act disrespectful. You act Jewishly. You act respectfully. You understand that the grace that you've received, the kindness that you've received from God, is the very same kindness Israel received, and that these people need you to live like kindly towards them. And um, and he wants to get there and and. And, and preach the gospel to his fellow Jews. And if this explodes, you know, if their resentment reaches its crescendo, you have no opening. It will already mm -hmm. be a separate movement. It's almost like he anticipates what happened and he's trying to stop it. So it's a totally different way of sort of understanding Paul's, uh, where he came from and what he's doing here later in Romans, you know, maybe 15, 20, 25 years into him doing this. And, um, Galatians actually is an interesting case where, if, if again, an analogy, whereas Romans looks like teenagers who are starting to say, hey, I got to fit in with my peers. And if you don't buy into it, then hooey on you, you know, to the parents. But Galatians is more like the little child that um, wants the parents' approval and, 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 and yet wants to find a way, you know, to, to, you know, to fit in. And when they're shamed, the expectation is that they'll run to the parent, that they'll look for consolation, not try to start breaking away like a teenager, you might anticipate in the case mm -hmm. of Romans. So in Galatians, he appeals to them in a, in a, in a very different kind of way. He uses ironic view, like... Uh, like parents do with, with a child that they think they can shame off a cliff, you know, this kind of ironic rebuking thing to make you stop and say, Hey, wait a minute. Maybe I am just being persuaded by peers and not thinking for myself, you know, uh, or which in Paul's case is thinking with me, <laughs> the parent uh, figure that he takes. Yeah. So I hope that kind of helps explain. I, I think what Paul was, uh, he stayed a Pharisee, but this revelation was, Oh, the end of the ages has arrived. Mm -hmm. I call it chronometrical, a chronometrical, you know, time-oriented discovery. In principle, other Jews would, could say the same. You know, you can read Isaiah and say, there's going to be a time when there's a picnic with wolves and lambs, and the lambs don't get eaten. And that's kind of the picture. You're saying this has started now, so we have to enact it. That's why he calls on them to live according to the spirit of, it's the age to come spirit of God live this way uh, in a utopian way, in a claim way, in the present evil age, and demonstrate what we claim. Otherwise, it's not convincing, and this whole project is, is, is not going to succeed. That's, I hope that kind of, I don't know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's going all over the place, but I hope it kind of gives you a narrative for how Paul, what I think makes Paul distinctive, and also why he's so uh, principle, like in his in the Antioch incident in Galatians two, he you can't waver on this, guys, because you're exposed these non Jews to a great deal of marginality to uphold this gospel truth of the gospel claim, 
And if we then pull rank as Jews, so the rank is still there. It's still a Jewish movement. If we pull rank as Jews, we expose the lie that these non-Jews aren't our equals unless they Judaize, unless they become Jews. And we can't do that in order to kind of quiet, you know, pressure that we receive any mm-hmm. more than they can go ahead and get circumcised to quiet the pressure they're receiving, not just from Jews, but from their family members. They're not doing cold. Their family is threatened. Their neighborhood is threatened. The gods are going to be angry. The Romans are going to be angry. Our city is going to be um, ostracized because we've allowed people, we haven't policed, we've allowed people to not worship according to what they need to. Jews is one thing, but these aren't Jews. This is my son. This is my my, my neighbor's kid. This is my dad. Uh, it's not okay, dad. You can't do this. You have to worship the, the, the family gods and the, and the civic leaders. And, you know, otherwise, it's very dangerous. Or if, if you're so crazy, you want to become a Jew, at least then the threat is off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you said a uh, again. You said a couple of things I want to go back to. Um, you know, the idea that a lot of the opposition or the you know people digging in their heels against new people coming in or, or trying to force them to fit the the existing mold comes fr- frequently comes from a place of fear, and to an extent, that's it's understandable. I mean, mm-hmm. if you if you have a faith that believes certain things are absolutely true. When you've got new people coming in with new ideas, we can't compromise on these fundamental truths because otherwise, you know, we're all living and teaching a lie. And it's important, like, but you have to be able to question, is what I believe actually true? And maybe I am believe, living and believing a lie. So there, there's some kind of balancing there where you have to allow people coming in with new ideas and be willing to consider them and talk through those ideas because as i mean if you've taken your faith seriously in or history at some point you've come to a realization that everything you taught everything you were you were taught before was wrong or at least some of the fundamentals were wrong and now you've got to change something big and you, you have to be able to to pivot like that and right. you know there's there's a lot of fear that comes in in a place like that yeah, that's uh, right. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is that, uh, you know, Paul is saying that all of these Gentiles, they want to come worship our God. And this is a good thing. God says he wants them to come and worship him. Uh, and they've given up their idolatry, but they're just not Jews. And you know, going back to Acts again, that, that Acts 15 council, mm-hmm. there's a lot of misunderstanding about the things that, that James and Peter said that the Gentile converts need to do. You know, they gave them four requirements and, you know, Christian theologians have gone round and round about what these four requirements mean, but they all seem to seem to center on idolatry. These are all things that happen at a pagan temple. You know, the, the consuming of blood, um, you know, uh, temple prostitution. Um, so there were, there were things strangled from blood, uh, sexual immorality and idolatry. So all of these things are directly connected to idolatrous practices. And then they were saying, and then you can go to the synagogue every Shabbat and hear Moses taught. Mm -hmm. And this is the opposite of what we want to do. We want to put every, everybody through a catechism first and say, you can come fellowship with us after you finish all these classes. And, you know, after you go through all these steps and at the end you get circumcised or, you know, whatever your religion's version of that is. And then you can come be part of us. But Paul and James and Peter seem to be saying, you know, get this one thing right. And then you can come and learn with us. And I think that that is a huge difference. In yeah, uh, yeah, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's a little messy. It's kind of like, um, I mean, you have to be polite, right? If you go to, a, mm-hmm. if you're not Catholic, you go to a Catholic funeral or wedding, you know, there's a certain behavior that they expect of a non-Catholic. But there's other behavior they don't expect of a non-Catholic. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's a certain amount of politeness, we might call it, to the neighbor. And Basically, yeah, this is demonstrating that you've changed from idolaters. Uh, however you parse the details, this is ritual purity issues, not just moral. This is ritual. This is the way 
uh, uh, the Jewish community recognize that you are some kind of righteous Gentiles, um, that you've really turned in some way to worship our God without becoming proselytes. And um, the problem is still going to be there because you're not proselytes. And so um, I think you have to realize our society, we have hierarchy, hierarchical arrangements. The British is still more explicit. Americans try to hide it, you know, we kind of lie about it, but they're still there. There's the rich and the beautiful and, uh, and the powerful, and they have special places. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't have it to the same degree as antiquity, but antiquity had it everywhere. What seat you came in, when we, when we go to this, when I was a professor, kids came in the classroom. I didn't tell them, you know, this, the politicians' children get to sit on the front row and the slaves' children get to sit in the back row. This is the way it is. That's the way it was. And uh, we, you know, we find these stadiums with the names on them. Who can sit where? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything was ranked at the dinner table, at the, at the symposium, uh, we'd call it. Everything was ranked. So how would a Jewish community have a meal with non-Jews? They could have meals. A lot of people say you know, Jews can eat none. That's that's nonsense. There were some no no sense no no doubt. There's some weird Jewish groups that were that way. Just, there's always weird groups. There's always extremists. But in general, mm -hmm. they're part of the Greco-Roman world, as I said earlier. They're part of the society, like American Jews are. They figure things out. Um, but but they would rank a meal where you sit. And so, uh, and what you're served, the cut of meat, how much the wine to water was measured. These were all highly articulated, what we would call discrimination, hierarchical discrimination based on difference of ranking. And that includes ethnicity. And mm -hmm. um, so how would you have a meal with non-Jews? If they're guests, it's one thing, you have a special place for guests. If they're proselytes, then they're, they might still have some discriminatory seating uh, because proselytes are on their way to being full Jews. And it takes a few generations before you lose uh, the connection that they're newcomers. They don't come genealogically from Abraham. Those, those dang Moabites. And, right. So you have these <laughs> kinds of things. But, but um, uh, forgetting the new one, this, you have this discrimination. And if the Christ groups are saying it's the end of the ages, then they're saying that the other nations have to eat, eat as equals at this meal. The wolf and the lamb eat at the same picnic. They don't mm -hmm. change wolves into lambs. Normally, of course, it's bad picnic for lambs to come to. That's Israel in this imagery. But now the point is that the wolves can eat with us as our equal members in the picnic of, of, the, of the messianic age. And so once you do that, you're sending us a, a very visible social signal. It's very witnessable that you're doing something that is deviant from the way that communities work and you're making a mm -hmm. claim. And, uh, and so um, this is where the rub was. I think this is really, Paul calls it the truth of the gospel. If you ask people, what's the gospel? They start all kinds of stuff, and, and I understand. But Paul says the truth of the gospel is that these non-Jews, as non-Jews, are our equals, Peter. We eat together with them as our equals. And, and, and this is the truth of the gospel. They remain non-Jews. And the Jews, of course, for this syllogism to make any sense, for this logic to make any sense, have to remain Jews. They circumcise mm -hmm. their sons. And uh, there's the rub. That's not going to work very easily, right? Because when you have difference, especially in a highly articulated society, but even in ours, black and white, Asian and, and European, rich and poor, beautiful mm -hmm. and ugly, fat and thin, don't care what it is. When you have difference, you tend to have discrimination. Yeah, even if it's time. not imposed, we're going to self-impose exactly. discrimination. Exactly. Even if it's not articulated, it's mm -hmm. a prejudice. And, um, and so it's very real. And this is a project that was, it has to fail. In the present age, the way we are, it has to fail. Unless, and that's why Paul keeps appealing to the spirit, unless you can live in some divinely inspired and empowered way, you mm -hmm. can't do this. 
And as we can see from history, that's mostly been a failed project, but that's not to say it's not the project. It's the conviction. It's, it's the belief. Yeah. It's just that yeah, last week we, uh, when we started with Romans one, um, someone made the observation, you know, Paul introduces saying that, you know, he was sent to, to bring the gospel. And uh, someone made the observation that the core of the gospel is the restoration of relationships, mostly between God and his people. But it goes beyond that. You know, like you're saying, recognizing that all, all people are called to worship the same God. I mean, God created us all. So we're all, we're all his children in that sense. We are all called to become his children in a greater sense. Mm-hmm. And when you've got a household full of children, I mean, there is going to be somebody Somebody's going to be the favorite. Somebody's going to be the eldest son. Yeah. But for the most part, you're all children. You're all equally sons and daughters. Right. right. Uh, we're about an hour. And, then you get an ado- and, and, and to stay with your metaphor, then you get an adopted child. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's more like for these non-Jews who come in. Yeah, it, it takes a lot more effort, child. but you've, you've got to do it. You've got to integrate this adopted child. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're an hour in, so I want to transition here to start taking some some questions and comments. Uh, we've got a pretty good sized group. Um, you know, and welcome those of you who came in a little bit late. Glad you're here. Even if you come in late, that's fine. Um, keep yourself muted unless you got a question. But if you've got something to say, you want to ask uh, Dr. Nanos a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, if you don't want to speak out loud, if you don't want to be on uh, on YouTube or something like that, you can put something in the comments. And I'll get to those also. So who here's got some some questions or comments? I know somebody does. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a little while to get going. Yeah, there's, so go many, yeah, there's so many of them, but um, I guess I'll start with a, a low ball, um, at least, I think. I, I know there's a lot of misunderstandings that both, um, you know, Judaism and Christianity half of Paul. But if you had to pick one from each of was their misunderstanding of Paul, what would that be? Well, it was one great misunderstanding that Paul converted from Judaism to Christianity. He's the quintessential convert, and he's no such thing. First of all, there's no Christianity, so you can't convert to something that doesn't exist. Uh, second of all, if he remained uh, a Jew practicing a Jewish way of life and advocating that non-Jews practice a Jewish way of life without becoming Jews, that hardly qualifies for uh, the quintessential convert who was turning his back or putting a negative, uh, a, 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 a negative binary versus his new identity as a Christian with a new uh, reaching to the Gentiles because the Jews, you know, the normal explanations, the Jews failed to do the Torah or they rejected God or they killed Christ or they uh, have an inferior religion, all of those kinds of things that go into that Paul was a convert. Jews and Christians are both wrong about, but it's really a Christian model that Jews are just reacting to. Uh, And I think it's so wrong. Thank you, Dr. Mar. Appreciate you being here. I'm sorry. Did you I said thank you. you appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Um, I know uh, Brian and Heidi are going to have some kind of comment, I know, or question. Um, you've all been listening. I know you've got comments, and we've got uh, more than a dozen people here, so... I got, I got plenty yeah. of them. Give me a chance, uh, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if you don't, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, before you read Romans. I'm happy to do that. So if don't force yourself to come up with something. If you're, I would guess you'd have a lot of them, maybe objections, maybe, maybe, maybe praise, but uh, we can always hope for the latter, but I'm happy with the former. I, but I'm also happy to talk to you about, more about uh, Romans in particular, if you like. I'll, I'll have another one for you as, as everybody else thinks about it. I, I like what you said about having not reading something with like preconceived notions. And that's when like, that's, that's what I did when I went back to the scriptures myself. I, was, I try to tell myself, all right, man, don't, 
don't get too involved in like traditions and doctrines that you know you've been um, um, been shown. So try try to the best of your abilities, you know, block that out as you read the scriptures. Now that's difficult, I think, to to do. Um, it's easier said than done for sure. But if you would have to give an advice to someone to say, okay, you think you know the scriptures, you think you understand them, um, you got to go back and read them. What are some key points that you will say, keep these things in mind as you go back and read it without preconceived notions? Well, you know, there are so many things, but, uh, but just to say one that's so important is if we're honest with ourselves, we have something called confirmation bias. We like to find things that confirm what we believe, what we think, what we feel, what we like, what our sensibilities are. And so we should be very suspicious when that's what we find. We should be very suspicious because it fits so nicely with what we want to find. And I have to do this with myself. I've taken an, an alternative paradigm challenge the prevailing paradigm and when i find things that fit my paradigm so nicely i need to stop and say oh mark is that really what's there uh because you like that and it's going to give you more ammunition uh it's like um what's called apologetics in christianity which is defense well that means you're not asking open-mindedly whether the alternative is there, you're defending what you already believe from a threat, from what you suppose is a threat. Many times they're not a threat. I don't think what I'm doing is a threat. It's a threat to what you think, but it's not a threat to what you ought to think, what you, you know, what you, to your allegiance to Jesus as Messiah. It's not a threat to that. You know, I'm not saying that that's not what uh, Paul taught, but I'm, what it means for you is a little different. And so that's the first thing is just authenticity, you know, just be honest that confirmation biases, like look at our political, uh, uh, you know, the discourse is confirmation bias, talking past each other, not listening, not actually wanting to listen. And, and it's the same in religious uh, discourse and the same in our own reading. Um, you know, so that's one just sort of, practice of authenticity. Um, another, another is, you know, really asking yourself why we're reading this. And I think this is what is a difficult thing for, for Jews as well as Christians in, in whatever their religious texts are, Muslims, Hindus, it doesn't matter. If, you're, if your search is for guidance and you've privileged these texts and the person who's writing to give you that guidance, it's very hard to be um, to use good judgment, I would say, judgment about is that is that good guidance? You know, if you hold Paul to the same standards that he calls for, he doesn't always live up to it. He he has curse wishes on people who disagree with him. That's not <laughs> not nice. That's not according to the same ideals that he calls people to. That they should seek peace with everyone as far as possible. That they should not. Uh, defend themselves against the the enemy that they should that they should love them. Um, he calls for his people that he's writing to to take his opinion over other people's opinions and over their own, but he doesn't allow the same for someone else to say. Well, you ought to consider my opinion over Paul's, right? He's there are places where you should maybe say, hey, you know. That's not according to your own ideals. Uh, he, he can be very, um, can be very, uh, I say, ungenerous towards someone else who's got a nuance different than the nuance he has. That's a personality. I think Paul's kind of, that's kind of Paul's personality style. But you know, when you, you know people like that, you might be that kind of person. Then you have to kind of take them with a, grain of salt, right, as they say, because that's kind of the way they are. But you know what? He also says he's very diplomatic in 1 Corinthians 9. He adjusts his rhetorical behavior to different kinds of people's sets of premises. 
to, to somebody who's weak or on the most, meaning lawless, he, he, he talks differently. Look at Acts 17, the Aragopagus speech. The way he talks to the Greek uh, philosophers is different than the beginning of the chapter where he spoke in the synagogue and, and talked about the, the, the scriptures. He doesn't talk about the scriptures with them. So he can be diplomatic. He can be nuanced. But when someone else is in a way that he doesn't like, he's not forgiving. We should be able to, to, to recognize that because if you're looking for guidance, which, which do you want to model yourself on? So those are the kinds of things now, obviously, studying, studying biblical <laughs> uh, you know, context, all kinds of materials that are out there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, many of them are privileging interpretations, I think, are very wrong. It'll take a while before that there's much that changes. If you like what I'm doing, I, of course, my work, and uh, there's other people writing from a Paul within Judaism perspective. It's now kind of a named perspective. Um, Paula Fredrickson is a very good writer and very accessible, and there are others. So if you look into that, Paul within Judaism, go to my website and and just or just uh, you know do a search on Paul within Judaism. Um, those are people trying to help you read these texts in a more historically oriented rather than confessionally oriented way. Many of them have confession confessional. Some are Jews. Some are or Christians, some are practicing Christians and, and, and uh, uh, ordained ministers. Uh, Anders Renneson is an ordained Lutheran minister, a uh, Swedish guy, teaches in Norway, fabulous scholar on Matthew and on Paul. Um, and he's part of the Paul Green Judaism uh, movement, and so on. So those are a few. I, I think you mentioned your website, um, marknanos.com. Is that the website you're you're yes. thinking of? Okay, yeah. yeah. By all means, go check out marknanos.com, his blog. Uh, some some great articles there too. Uh, Jenny and Brad, you got your hand up. Want to go ahead? Uh, well, you you started to answer the question a little bit, but I was wondering about uh, if we're just beginning on trying to really get the history. Um, what? What resources would you recommend if you're beginning in this journey of trying to really study from this historical perspective? Obviously, your works are a great place to start, um, but I didn't know if there were any other resources that you like for people trying to go down this road. You know, if you read myself and others in the Paul and Judaism, you'll see the kind of resources that we reference. There's a book, oh my gosh, let me. Um, there's a there's not been a lot of textbook yet because this perspective is still pretty new and um but there is one that came out with erdman's that was first in swedish and then updated for the english let me find uh, uh, the name of that for you <clears throat> i'm not at home with my library so i have to look at my Must be under. <clears throat> figure out who the lead editor was. If you want to, uh, if you want to just find that and send it to me later, I can put that in the notes. Okay. Yes, I'm not. I'm unfortunately, it didn't come out that long ago. Uh, but I'm not finding the name right away. But there's an Erdman's book that's come out that it was, it was all Swedish scholars that collaborated. First they did it in Swedish, then they updated and revised it. Anders Runnison and uh, Dieter Mitternach are the editors. As you can find the title, uh, something to do with Christian origins from Erdman. It's maybe four years old now, something like that. And, uh, and that's a nice resource. Uh, I don't necessarily you know, agree with everything. There's a lot of different contributors, so you're going to have uh, different things there. Also, um, one interesting place, again, where I don't necessarily agree with everyone, I did Romans for the Jewish Annotated New Testament. That's Oxford University Press. And each of the um, New Testament uh, books are annotated by a Jewish uh, person. 
some are not some are really using the old jewish christian paradigms of, of, of divisiveness some are not um that's that's also an interesting but when you look at these resources say paula frederickson or myself uh matthew Thiessen, oh that's a he's a good author he's written a some uh, uh almost popular style book series uh, coming out with a new one on Paul, but he has one on Jesus and purity. I think Brazos Press or Baker uh, Academic in, a couple of years ago, excellent. And then when you look at these books, you'll see the resources that we tend to, to respect more um, than say some of the ones that might be more commonly known. They're, and many of those are quite old, you know. Um, it's not an easy task, but it's, and, and there haven't been many introductions, like I say, or textbooks written by people from this emerging perspective. It's, o- it's only a few decades old that, that people like myself have been doing this and uh, it'll take a while. Mm-hmm. Um, Paula, you got your hand up? Yeah, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Thank you for being here, Mark. We really appreciate uh, your perspective and what you're sharing. Right. Um, I. I was curious, and we talked about inside baseball earlier, Jay was mentioning that, and I was curious if there are any um, phrases or specific phrases that Paul tends to use in his writings um, that might be loaded with meaning that we might not understand from a Gentile context, but maybe more from a Jewish context that you might want to share about or talk about. You know, I think that's a great question. I think there are loads of them. And um, one I've been writing about in the last few years is ergonomu, which is um, the Greek words that are translated works of the law or the works of the law in Romans and Galatians. And I've been trying to show that ergonomu is nothing to do with the normal conception of works of the law versus faith, meaning uh, actions, uh, whether it's good works as Luther basically, you know, expanded it to, or more the Catholic, the ancient Catholic and and more common that's ritual or uh, um, type of aspects of Jewish life, like diet, dietary laws and uh, Sabbaths and so on. Uh, It's been understood that if you take that phrase and you read it that way as Christians have, as Gentile Christianity has since the third century, um, and certainly from Augustine and then Luther on, you miss, I think, miss entirely what it would have meant in in the context he's writing about as a Jewish person. I think what he's actually, I think a better uh, translation would be something like customary rites, not R-I-G-T-S, but R-I-T-E-S, as in circumcision, and whatever other rights are involved in the transformation process of moving from a Gentile to becoming a proselyte Jew. So it's a process, it's, a, it's plural rights. It's culminated in circumcision, which functions also as synecdoche and would have in that context. It doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean just a, the surgical cut. I don't think he cares anything about that, uh, you know, get a surgical cut or not. He cares about this meaning that you're becoming a religio ethnically a Jew when you weren't one. And ergonomu is, is, I think, an ironic jab because it's not in Torah. Now, I'll say that again. <laughs> Proselyte conversion, circumcising in non-Jews in order to make them Jews or Israelites is not in Torah. Correct. Anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. What's in there uh, you know, there if if the if the stranger among uh, the Israelites wants to take a Passover, they have to be circumcised. And if there's a slave of an Israelite household, they have to be circumcised. Either one of them. So I think actually what he's arguing, this is the language about the curse in, in, in chapter. I'm the one who's adding for them to become Jews. You're adding for us, and this was a practice developed in the period, in the Maccabean period, where um, uh, 
uh, it's the first time we kind of see what labels in the conversion. We have no, we actually don't know all the details except circumcision of males, which is a culminating, you know, uh, symbolic act that everybody knew what that meant. And um, so here's ergonomy has functioned as this contrary to faith, which really pissed us in a Greek context and a Jewish context, really means faithfulness or loyalty or trust. Not, not, I mean, it can be used for just believing some propositional claim, but that's not his primary reason. That's not the way Paul's using it. So faithfulness for a Jew involves circumcising your children. Faithfulness for a non-Jew involves not circumcising yourself. Ergonomu, the customary rites, are advocating within the Jewish community that you should become a Jew if you want these full access, because we have to comply with the Roman Empire's expectations of us in order to protect our own circumstance, right? Our own privilege that we don't have to participate in cult. I mean, it was perfectly reasonable for other Jews. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. I'm saying Paul's using this it, it, to try to answer your question in, in, a, in, a, in a way. He, he's using this, and it could be understood in a Jewish community what he's getting at. It's not in Torah. It's a customary. It's a custom. It's been developed. It's a rites of passage, and it works for us in our current Roman uh, environment, and you're messing with that, but it's not in Torah. Uh, Brian and Heidi mentioned a, a related term. I think it's in the uh, book of Acts on Paul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, uh, kicking against the goads. I mean, intuitively, we kind of get what that means, but yeah. what are goads and what, what would this mean to Paul yeah, or Luke kind of, or, you know, whoever it was yeah, written to? Of, yeah, kind of, uh, you know, I remember looking that up and I forgot, like just sticking, uh, isn't it like... Um, uh, they say rocks or um, remember uh, pointy objects or something. I can't remember what the literal. I remember looking that up myself as a curiosity, mm -hmm. but I don't. I don't remember actually. Yeah, the well, word is what, used. But, obviously, it's not in Greek; it's in Hebrew. But the word is used in First Samuel thirteen twenty one, uh, talking about uh, sharpening implements, farm implements. Uh huh. And a lot of times that's what you have to do. You have to go back and look at the Septuagint uh, Greek uh, as well as the Hebrew and then look at what Greeks, how Greeks use the language because it's just, again, like I say, an American Jew uses American English and the language is, a, you know, it's a funny game. There's all kinds of meanings in any one word or statement depending on context mm -hmm. and people and they can get it wrong. And surely we could get it wrong long after the, the case in a different language. But in this case, yes, the, the basic meaning, uh, you know, appears to be that, you know, he's had this, he's, he's, he's resisting um, the messianic claim that the end of the ages has arrived. He's trying, he's resisting that. He's trying to stop this movement of non-circumcising of Jew uh, of non-Jews in making them full uh, members as will be expected in the age to come. And he's, he's fighting against that and he, it's time to stop. I mean, but yeah, I don't know if that phrase is a particularly Hebrew phrase. So one of the things that happens in scholarship a lot are these phrases, words and phrases that are uh, in dissertations are examined for countless pages, every kind of usage, in the Greek world, in the Roman world, the Jewish world, different times, and, and, and so on. And sometimes they they um, can be really enlightening, but sometimes that you just don't still don't know because what matters is the context of the person who uses it. And what I find in a lot of these studies is then they revert to the Paul that they learned in Sunday school, and they apply it, and nothing's changed. It's very interesting. It's a lot of fun, but guess what? Nothing changed. And so um, that's to me pretty disappointing. That's that um, confirmation bias kind of thing. You know, rather, you mm -hmm. already know the answer. You're just finding some ways to, to make it sexy. 
but uh, yeah, and this might be some confirmation bias, but I was just that uh, kick against the goads is in Acts twenty six fourteen, and Jesus is saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And looking at the Greek word that's behind there, uh, you know, the King James translates it as pricks. And the word is kentron. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing. Um, but it just means something pointy and sharp. Yeah, and it I... immediately made me think of the, uh, the ram caught in the thicket at uh, uh, you know, the near sacrifice of Isaac, which I don't know whether it's intended to connect there or not, but that's yeah. where I went with it. Well, those things are all fun, you know, and they can be useful. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's the stuff with sermons. And uh, right. um, and it can be useful in historical inquiry. But as a general practice, I try to be really careful about that because um, it, unless there's a lot of other things in the context that give it, that, that are convincing, uh, yeah. it's just fun. And there's nothing wrong with having fun. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just if you build around that something that's uh, more than maybe it ought to be, then that's a bit of a right. Problem. Yeah, you're you're already balancing a card up on its end. Now, now you're just stacking more cards on top of it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then you get a. You, then you finally you get somebody comes along and sees this. Some clever person comes along and sees this, and, and now we have a new doctrine of whatever it is, and uh, and you have to be beholden to that doctrine. Because that's mm-hmm. just, that's the that's the group orientation. That's what makes us what we are, and uh, you know that's that's the way humans function. But it's, yeah. it's we should be careful. We should be careful because we're humans. So let's try not to function that way. Yeah, uh, Carlos has another question in the comments here. He says, uh, "What should we ponder as we understand that we are only reading the letters that Paul wrote and not the letters that he received?" We kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, but yeah, is there something else you want to add? Yeah, that's a that's one of those interesting things to think about and speculate about. The only case we know of is the Corinthian correspondence. We know that what we call First Corinthians is at least Second Corinthians because mm-hmm. they have they have uh, received a letter and responded to it with uh, some. Um, rejoinders let's call them you know they're not completely happy with, with some of things or at least the way they interpreted them and so paul uh enters into uh, a kind of discursive pattern in which he raises their question and in fact some christian theology is based on the question as if that's paul's position but <laughs> which is a which is funny but um and sad but uh He's raising the question in order to discuss it and maybe to um, disagree with the premises in the question or the conclusions that they were wanting uh, to get to. That's the only one I think I know of uh, for sure. I think there's a few others that are referred to that in, in either apocryphal literature or in other literature that could have been um, found. We don't know how many times he wrote. You know, that's one interesting thing about Acts of the Apostles. It doesn't mention he wrote any letters. So if we only had Acts, we wouldn't know Paul was a letter writer. Uh, so doing mm-hmm. history is kind of, it's, it's funny, it's funny business that once, once you get outside of what we have. Um, the other thing that's interesting is why, why do we have what we have in Paul? Because uh, we don't have any original autographs. We don't have anything from the first century. We don't have anything from the second century. A couple little passages uh, possibly dated to the second century. And that may be because they want to take it to the second century. It's hard to say when you get a little fragment of something that you have no context for. And then the third century, we start to get some stuff. And mostly the fourth century is when we have a full Pauline corpus that we can start Mm -hmm. to evaluate. Well, that's a few hundred years of scribal practices by interpretive communities. That's a problem. So we, we again, we have to be really humble. Uh, you're going to have some anomalies. You're going to have some things that don't make sense and don't add up, because you've had people trying to make sense of stuff that went through a whole cultural change. If it was mm-hmm. in a Jewish environment to try to advocate Judaism, now it's being translated and 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 um, and rewritten uh, by people who think. Paul was against Judaism and that this is a mm-hmm. religion, a superior religion, that 
a replacement religion, well, don't you think there'd be some differences that would probably yeah, somebody like John Chrysostomy, who, you know, has some pretty awful things to say. Exactly. So. He's, he's the one nasty cuss. And, uh, and, and, but it went on and on. I mean, a lot of Christian theology comes out of the third and fourth and fifth centuries fighting over who's the heretics and who's the orthodox. Mm-hmm. And we only get the winners in most cases. We don't have the losers' writings. We only have what the winners say the losers said. Well, listen to political discourse today. Do the people who are speaking usually represent accurately the other people's point of views from a generous representation, or do they vulgarize them and take out them out of context and make them sound as bad as they possibly can so that they can trump over them? And mm-hmm. in that process, Jews and Judaism were what they could find in the New Testament text by which they could brand their enemies as enemies, as Judaizers, as Jews, as Judaism, as works, as whatever it was that you needed to create a foil uh, in order to um, make the other group wrong and your group right. That's where Jews and Judaism function. And that's continued to this day. And this is yep. a big problem. Part of my project is to say, hey, you know, that's not what Paul was doing. Uh, I understand it's what you've done, and I understand it's in the traditions and so on, but it's not a probable representation of what Paul was doing, and it's hurting mm-hmm. and it's hurting you to internalize that way of life, that discourse, that way of thinking, that way of behaving towards other people. It's hurting you. You're not living up to your own ideals. Why, why not stop it? <laughs> Yeah, good word. Um, Brian and Heidi, got your hand up. Go ahead. Still there? Uh, maybe they stepped away. Sorry, no, I'm here. Oh, I'm here. There you I are. was my my screen was being weird. Um really, really enjoying this. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us. I've actually had your book, The Mystery of Romans, for probably 11 years, and it has been very um, very well used and enjoyed as a supplement to my study of the Book of Romans, so appreciate that. Um, one of the things that was really helpful for me in, in reading what you wrote was this paradigm shift about Paul's purpose, because my evangelical understanding of Paul's purpose was more that he was this wild card who came out to just blow up the system and be a rebel without a cause, so to speak. And, right. and that, right. that confirmation bias, as you were saying, then proceeded to color the way that he wrote in scripture about, about Jews and about the people who were coming into, you know, into the, uh, the gospel. And one of the, the statements that you wrote um, in your introduction was um, talking about how Paul's problem with his fellow Jews was with an ethnocentric exclusive, exclusivism, well, you know the word I'm saying, um, <laughs> that, that denied equal access to God's mercy. And I have seen such that that's, I I understand that about, you know, Paul's paradigm, but that is so profoundly become an earmark of the, um, of the evangelical church toward the Jews. And it just kind of, I, I guess, looking at Paul as an inspiration for, for how to, to, how to walk, obviously, you know, as, as an apostle, it, he has a lot of wisdom, but in how to walk in a way that's honoring God in his nature, rather than the exclusive exclusivity of a particular group, belief system, whatever. And it just, anyway, I didn't really have much of a question, but just that I have really appreciated your work and thank you for, for sharing with us today. Thanks. Um, Thanks. One of the, things I've tried to correct for myself as I've kind of grown in this from writing mystery to now is, is, you know, Paul was, he was uh, doing something inclusive because he believed in the, uh, 
the messianic age had arrived. So it's, that's why I call it chronometrical. He was convinced something in time had changed. His fellow Jews weren't being any less inclusive by um, not being convinced that moment had arrived. But in principle, most Jews would have said, well, you know, that's fine. When that arrives, you know, I mean, scriptures can be interpreted that to, to, they can be interpreted in other ways too, that when the Messiah comes, all the other nations are going to be destroyed. Um, there's different narratives present in the, in the scriptures and in other second temple Jewish literature, but a generous person, generous Jewish person, we can disagree in principle. It's not a matter of inclusive and exclusive necessarily. It's how you include, right? And for Paul, there is an exclusivity too. If you don't include by way of confession of Jesus as Messiah, you're excluded. And uh, in most Jewish groups that were advocating for proselyte uh, conversion, if you don't do that, so it would be like, you know, if you're not baptized in the Catholic church, you can be welcome as a guest. You could probably, you know, be on committees and, and so forth, but there are certain sacraments that you can't take or you can't participate in. But they're not being exclusive. I mean, you could say it's exclusive, but there, there's a way to be included. It's not that there isn't any way. You know, exclusivity and inclusivity is tricky. And so I've tried to be, I don't know if this is helpful to you. I hope it is. I've tried to be a little bit more careful because I have found how it can be weaponized to suppose that, that Paul and Christianity was inclusive in a way that Judaism wasn't able to be which in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, when the so-called new perspective was arising, that was, their, that was their focus, which was so much better than the traditional view. And when I was exposed to that around the time I was writing Mystery of Romans, um, I, I sometimes think I wasn't careful enough because that was just where the discourse was. And it was so much better than where it had been. But as it went on, I, I realized some of the problems in that discourse. It was still framed by a traditional Christian versus Judaism and always finding something superior versus the inferior other. And uh, that's why I like to focus on the time element because it's not inferior and superior. It's different, a different set of claims about what's appropriate now. And if you don't believe those claims, then you don't believe it's appropriate. That's kind of a different thing. I hope that makes sense. Sorry, I had to mute you there for a second, Heidi. You're starting to echo. Yeah, I was hearing myself in her. Yeah. Uh, we're, people are starting to drop off like flies here. So that's usually okay. a sign right. that, that we've reached the end of everybody's patience and interest. I mean, I. I I would love to sit and talk more, um, but uh, if, quick question. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly, Nanos? You can say Nanos or Nanos. I say Nanos. Uh, okay. But um, if you're Latvian, as were my grandparents, then you would say Nanos. If you're Greek, uh, you would say Nanos. And uh, so I, I adapted the, the Greek form. Okay, sounds good. Um, Dr. Nanos, Nanos. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, be, no. Before, before we, we hang up here, um, share any other resources, uh, give your website again, anything else that you want to share with people and maybe a, a parting word. Um, yeah, I think I shared what I can. You know, if you go to my website, you can get my stuff and the people that I'm talking about. If you read my books, you'll see who, who I'm footnoting. And um, I would really encourage you, if, if you're, while you're doing Romans, that somebody, uh, that yourself and some others perhaps, look at my reading um, Romans within Judaism because it has essays since the mystery of Romans. So it has, you know, almost 30 years. Uh, I finished writing that 30 years ago mystery of Romans. So it has a lot of uh, development in my thought, especially on Romans 11, 9 to 11, which are so, uh, so central. Also Romans 2, reconsidering and, and uh, other places. It has essays about interacting with other scholarship uh, that reacted to mystery of Romans and so on. So I, I would encourage, uh, as I say, and if you're interested in the broader 
Paul within Judaism book is a, it's a pretty small book and they're both fairly inexpensive uh, Cascade books make. One reason I like them is that they make them accessible. Uh, but thank you. I hope that you'll, that you'll um, take, take this to heart as you read Romans and think about Paul writing this to advocate for a Jewish way of life uh, without becoming Jews and the kind of problems that that creates. He's, and, and, and Jews don't need to be told they're sinners and all this sort of normative stuff. They know they're sinners. And he's quoting the Jewish scriptures when he says that. It's not, that's not the problem. The problem mm -hmm. is how do you, as a Jew, who's not allowing non-Jews to become Jew, how do you encourage those non-Jews to see themselves comfortably as equals, but not as superior? Not, you know, because that's normally what happens. If, you, if, if, if you're in an inferior position, then you turn it into a superior position and it creates this kind of um, conflict that represents what Christianity and Judaism you know, became towards Judaism. And he was, I think he was seeing the first elements of it. He wasn't trying to start that. He was trying to stop it. And uh, uh, he, he's, he's praising the Jewish way of life. A Jewish person can do Torah. A non-Jewish person mm -hmm. trying to do this, convert into Torah, this is a big problem. You weren't enculturated into this. If you think of it this way, you can kind of understand, maybe at least think about the tensions uh, in Romans in a different light. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There are two other questions that are coming in here late, and you can choose to answer them or not. Um, okay. The, the first one is, would you say that the modern day Messianic Jewish movement applies Paul in his correct context? And well, that's a pretty broad. That's a pretty broad question, and I, I don't think I'm an expert on the Messianic Jewish movement. I know some UMJC people uh, uh, personally. I know uh, some of the leaders. I think they're uh, making quite an effort to um, understand Paul in in not only in Judaism, but in which kind of anachronistic in rabbinic Judaism, which is different than the Judaism of Paul's time. Um, but that's the Judaism of their time. And I think they face the problem that they're really a Christian sect and they're fighting out of that. And they're trained in Christian theology. They ask the premises in their questions and the ways they uh, imagine they can be answered are still framed by Christian theology. And so this creates a real problem. Um, but I think some of them are really, you know, trying, trying to do something. I don't think it resembles first century Judaism um, very well, but it, it can't. We're not in the first century. And, uh, um, and that's okay. But I, I think that uh, it's natural then to read back in. It's natural, but that doesn't make it historically accurate. Mm -hmm. um, the other question is one that I know everybody here has been thinking this entire time and has been afraid to ask is, all this time that you've spent studying Paul in New Testament writings, what has prevented you from, you know, shifting, you know, crossing that aisle over to recognizing Jesus as the Jewish Messiah? Oh, that would be, that would be a little too involved and probably a little too personal, but I just, I, I'm not persuaded. And I think this is one of the arguments I've tried to make in uh, rereading Romans 11. Actually, what Paul is, uh, is translated in, in verses uh, 30 to 32 as disobedient. Uh, uh, they were disobedient. Uh, you, were, you, were, they were dis you were disobedient. They were disobedient. That word disobedient doesn't mean uh, disobedience. It means not persuaded. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and if you're not persuaded of something, then you're not being faithful to, to, to you know, I'm being faithful to what I, what I understand uh, the truth to be, and uh, or I'm not sure what the truth would, would be is, and I think this has been a problem actually in Christian uh, mindset that other people are rejecting something that is a truth. Well, it's a truth claim. It's not empirically right. verifiable. It's not a truth. Uh, I don't think most Christians are rejecting Islam. Uh, they just aren't interested, or they don't know anything about it or they don't, uh, they're not interested in converting to it because they have something that they believe is true. 
And mm -hmm. they're not confronted with a truth that they know is true that they then deny because they don't want to go there. I mean, that could happen to a person, but I don't think that's the case for most people. If you're not persuaded of something, you're not persuaded of it. That's yeah. That's a yeah, and I've that's seen being fake, that's being authentic. Yeah. I've seen in my own yeah. conversations with people of different faiths or even different denominations is that we have our theological terms are so loaded with doctrinal baggage that they mean completely different things to different people. And we're not, we think we're communicating and we're not even speaking the same language. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see the language of rejecting Jews all the time. Jews reject Jesus as Messiah. This, that. mm -hmm. That's just not really a useful conversation. It's, they're not persuaded. Uh, so, you know, why would you be, and why would you be persuaded of Christianity later on? when it's nothing to do with the original Jewish movement. And this is uh, actually a point about Paul. Paul was not trying to convert anyone into Christianity to lead Judaism, a Jewish way of life, Jewish identity, but that's what it became. And so why would a Jewish person do that? That's leaving their, that's not what Paul was doing. He was bringing non-Jews into Judaism without making them Jews. That's not what Christianity does. And so, it, it, you know, you just have to, to be a little more thoughtful, I would guess, historically, uh, less anachronistic, but also more generous. I think people on both sides of the aisle, every side of the aisle, need to be more generous towards the other person on the same terms they'd like generosity towards themselves. I mean, isn't that, mm -hmm. <laughs> isn't yeah, that what Jesus and Paul and central. Moses yeah. and so on? <laughs> yeah. If exactly. not that, then what? Yeah, if not that, then what? And I think that's what's missing an awful lot is the generosity. There's, mm -hmm. there's just so much generalism. Yeah. And as you say, it's built into the theological jargon, and, but it's it's built into the worldview. Uh, I mean, I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many people have said to me, well, I mean, but you know that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, how do you know? I don't mind that you believe that, but you don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paula, was did you have something you wanted to add? No, I just I just appreciate your answer to that, Mark. It's it it's honest and it's um I think I think it's very accurate uh, about most most people who um have not come to that same conclusion as some of us have. It, it's not not being persuaded is a very accurate way to describe that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you again, Mark. I really appreciate you being here and everybody else. I appreciate you joining us in your questions and comments. You guys, as always, you make all, doing this all worthwhile. So uh, not meeting tomorrow. We are meeting next Thursday and next month's theme is biblical leadership. So stick around, go visit uh, Dr. Nanos website, marknanos.com. I'll, I'll, I'm going to alternate, say it different each time. So. <laughs> It's not, it's not a bother. We say it different in the same family. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Sure. Be blessed. Happy birthday, Jay. <laughs> Thank you.